Uh, hello everybody and welcome to this EGU webinar on Mentoring 101 and the EGU Mentoring Scheme. Uh, today you'll hear from four speakers to tell you all about their experiences of mentoring and also the EGU Mentoring Scheme. Alongside we'll also hear a little bit about the Outstanding Student and PhD Candidate Presentation Award. Uh, my name is Jenny Turson and I am a Senior Advisor at a, a science and research company in the Arctic. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, Solmaz Mahadja, who is a professor, assistant professor at the University of Central Asia, and she has a research background in um, geology, but is also the EGU um, uh, mentoring officer and on the outreach committee. Thank you, Jenny, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. My name is Solmaz Mohajer, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Central Asia. I'm also uh, a member of the EGU Outreach Committee, and this year I am happy to support the mentoring program at EGU 22. So um, today I just want to take a few minutes to introduce our mentoring program and hopefully um, encourage you to um, participate in this program, either as a mentee or a mentor. So um, the aim of this program is actually to support first time conference attendees or the mentees. And um, as you may know, EGU General Assembly or any other large conference can be a very overwhelming experience for any scientist, uh, but especially for those who are attending for the very first time. So the program is there to provide support to those who need it and also to help um, the mentees build connections with other researchers in their field. And the way EGU mentoring program does that is uh, through several activities. Um, one of them is helping the mentees to navigate the conference. So whether or not the conference is virtual or in person, uh, the mentees can uh, rely on the support that they can get from the mentors to um, know how to navigate um, in this very large conference um, and um, be able to attend the sessions that are uh, beneficial to them, but also become more aware of other opportunities that exist out there, including professional development activities, um, also career development opportunities. Um, but I would also say most importantly, the program is there to really support uh, networking. And um, we actually encourage the mentors to um, introduce at least one or three of their own colleagues or people that they know that could benefit their mentees to their mentees. So this is another way of um, supporting the mentees throughout this program. We also encourage the mentors to um, connect you with at least one to three of their own colleagues or people that they know could potentially be beneficial to you. And finally, um, this mentorship program will provide um, you an opportunity to exchange feedback on professional activities, um, career development opportunities, or any other um, program that might be beneficial to you. So to take advantage of this program, um, the very first thing that um, is required is that um, you should be registered for the EGU 22 um, 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 as General Assembly. So if you have registered for that, then you are qualified for this program. If you haven't and you're planning to do that, that's also great. So just make sure that you are planning to attend the EGU 22 in order to participate in this program. And um, here I've shown the link. So if you go to this link that's shown here, and I'll ask Jenny um, to put this link in the chat box for you as well so that you have access to it. If you go to this uh, link, you will see uh, um, another link for registration form. And um, all you need to do is to click on that and complete the registration form to sign up for the program. Um, please note that we have two deadlines for the mentees and the mentors. Um, the program is open for the mentees until March 25th and for the mentors until April 11. And the difference between these two dates is because we, um, we often get more mentees than mentors. And we wanna make sure that we, we are able to support all the mentees that we can get. So we are extending the deadline for the mentors uh, a little bit more so that we can uh, recruit um, perhaps uh, more mentors so that all the mentees can have uh, someone to be matched with. So once you go to that link and you see the registration form, um, I also have some details here on the slides that's shown here. Um, it took me about 10 minutes to register as a mentor. Um, and this is my second time doing this um, uh, form. So um, 
it's quite easy and you don't have to spend too much time completing it. Um, you will be asked to indicate your mentoring role. So whether or not you want to be a mentor or a mentee. Um, and you will be also asked to indicate how many general assembly meetings you have attended so far. So if you are planning to apply as a mentor, uh, you can do that if you have attended at least two EGU GA meetings. And this could also be um, the meetings in the last two years, which were virtually done. And if you want to apply as a mentee, the only requirement is that um, you have never attended the EGU General Assembly meeting before, or you have attended it only once. Uh, so once you meet those requirements, then um, you are all set. You will be asked to enter some information, just general information about your affiliation, uh, the country of affiliation, your position, the languages that you speak, um, and most importantly, your uh, scientific divisions within the EGU and the research interests. Now, um, the scientific divisions is not a mandatory field. So if you are not part of any scientific division at the EGU, don't worry too much about it. What really is um, important is your research interest. And you have an opportunity to select uh, from a long list of um, interests, uh, those that uh, apply to you. And finally, you're asked to provide a very short introduction. Uh, so this is a very small paragraph about yourself and indicate your gender preferences. Um, if you ask us to match you with a specific gender preference, um, then this um, parameter will take priority over your scientific divisions and research interests. And the idea here is that if someone wants to be matched with a specific gender, um, we respect that and we prioritize that. So once you have done that, um, what's next? And what can you expect from the mentoring program? So once we have that information from the mentees and the mentors, then we will uh, go through all the information and we will try to find the best match for you. Uh, once we have the best match for you, we will inform you via email. We will inform the mentees and the mentors and we'll encourage you to get in contact with one another. And um, we also offer some ideas and tips as to how to um, connect prior to the EGU 22 event and how to maintain that connection throughout the program and even perhaps later. Um, we are organizing an icebreaker event that will uh, most likely be held virtually. We encourage you to attend that event. Um, this would be a really good chance to again, get more acquainted with your mentor, but also meet other mentees and mentors participating in the program. We also let you know about some of the short courses and networking opportunities that are relevant um, to you. Um, and in terms of the suggestions that we make uh, to the mentor and the mentee pairs, um, we ask you to contact each other um, and meet at least once prior to the EGU 22 meeting. And this meeting obviously can be done virtually. And during this meeting, uh, we recommend that you define your own program together um, for during the GA meeting and possibly after that and really discuss your objectives for the mentoring program. So this would be a great opportunity for a mentee, for instance, to um, explain what they really want to get out of um, this relationship. And for the mentor to also be clear whether or not he or she can uh, provide that. Um, you will also um, be encouraged to meet again at the end of the GA meeting um, so that you can um, continue your discussions to exchange some feedback or even possibly um, discuss some um, future connections that you would like to maintain. Um, but it's very important for you to know that um, it is completely up to you how many times you would like to connect with your mentor or with your mentee um, and how you want to go about spending your time uh, during this um, relationship that you have uh, during the meeting and maybe even possibly afterwards. But this is completely up to you. We are here to support you, but uh, you take the lead uh, once you are matched. So with that, I will end uh, my um, short presentation. If you have any question, you can contact me via the email that's shown there. And, um, and again, I encourage you to sign up for this program. If you would like to sign up as a mentor, we also encourage early career scientists um, to also participate as mentors, especially if they have attended the EGU meeting um, at least twice. And, and for the mentees to really take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salmas. That's a really great introduction, so much information. And all of this will be, or is available on the EGU website. So please take a look there. Um, for any more information. 
Um, now I would like to introduce a previous mentor that we um, have had at the EGU and in other schemes. Um, this is Stephanie Zims, and she's a lecturer in researcher development at the University of West Scotland. And she used to also be involved in the EGU as the early career science representative and a number of other uh, avenues. So perhaps you've seen her around. Stephanie. Thanks so much, Jenny. Yeah, it's, it, I'm still kind of attached to EGU, even though I don't really do geosciences anymore, but it's hard to hard to let go from such a great organization. Um, and it was great to hear from Solmas about obviously all the benefits to the mentees, but I wanted to focus a little bit what you can get out of this as a as a mentor. And I have mentored once. I think the mentoring scheme came in towards the end of my kind of very active phase um, at EGU, but I have mentored um, since kind of through um, kind of a Twitter program. I don't think it runs anymore, but um, I got matched with a, a geoscientist. Um, I think we've been working together now actually 18 months or something like that. Um, and what I really enjoy from the mentoring perspective is actually learning from someone's experience that's very different to my own. So the, the um, person I'm mentoring at the moment is a black geoscientist in the UK. And just hearing kind of, you know, her experiences around job applications or other things, um, some of them are truths that you hear about, but actually having that kind of personal um, connection to those experiences um, really helped me to maybe see how I want to change some of the things that are happening, how I want to use, um, I guess, my, my input and what I have at my own institution, but also the, the wider field to support, um, you know, scientists, not just geoscientists, but scientists and researchers um, in similar situations, for example. And it's really a way, I think, for you to A, stay connected, what happens. We sometimes, um, depending on where we are on the career ladder, can maybe forget um, what it's like, you know, starting out, things do change, the funding landscape change, changes all the time, you know, how people maybe move from PhD to to postdoc to other things um, that I know there's a lot more interest, for example, going into industry. Um, and I think as a, obviously it is important as a mentee to have someone who knows a little bit about some of these things. Um, and obviously that's where the matching comes in. But I really think it's important for you to kind of use the role as a mentor to learn from a mentee. For me, this is always a two way relationship. It's not just uh, me telling a person you know, this is what I did, so you should do the same. It's more actually using my experience to maybe help someone figure out what they want to do. I think it's really important to have some of those questions uh, in mind in what they want to do next and have you thought about that. So with my uh, mentee, for example, I share a lot of resources that help her reflect. Um, I have a lot of different um, kind of sheets I find online that I'm like, this is a good exercise to look back, you know, what have you done in the last six months? What do you want to do? And then we, we talk about it. And it's actually, it's that discussion that really helps. It's not me giving advice. It's not me, you know, saying do A, B and C, and then you'll end up where you want to end up. It's actually trying to be more of a, a bit of a guide in a way and a, and a cheerleader. I've seen um, with, uh, with a mentee I have at a moment, a lot of it was around confidence building, especially after getting rejection, after rejection, after rejection, having someone kind of in the corner that um, helps you, um, you know, pick yourself up again, have maybe a look um, over that. I know when you attend the General Assembly, you probably won't have that kind of, you know, it's not that long a time frame. But if you are thinking about longer term um, experiences, especially if you are as a mentor, if you're willing to um, I don't want to say give up of your time because it's not really a giving up of time. I really, I get so much back um, from the, this um, relationship. But if there is something you could see happening longer term, and it depends obviously on the match, it's really worthwhile to think about how you can um, support a person through some of the things they will encounter. Um, and you will develop a little toolbox for yourself as well. There's definitely things I found, um, for example, the reflection exercises that I end up using uh, myself um, and I share in um, with like colleagues for example as well so definitely um, don't just think about it with kind of a mentee hat on and as Soma said if you've been to two general assemblies I think you can sign up to do both as well if you want to so if you want to be uh, maybe depending where you are in a phase um, mentored but also do the mentoring you can maybe think about um, um, if you can do both um, obviously if there are 
more mentees and mentors than you if you've been maybe mentored before if you're a bit more experienced you might not get one but i definitely recommend you think about um mentoring as well i know it can seem like two general assemblies you might feel like you're not like what do i have to offer i've only been twice maybe you're towards the end of a phd maybe you just started a postdoc people will definitely benefit from your experience and you will benefit from that discussion so don't think um, you know, don't let imposter syndrome get in the way of signing up to be a mentor. Um, people will def definitely benefit from your experience and having that one to one connection, which something like the General Assembly can be a little bit difficult to find sometimes. And especially with the hybrid, it might be nice to have that, uh, you know, that personal contact with one person, especially meeting beforehand and getting over some of those hurdles. Um, I think that's probably all from me for now. If that's OK. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very nice um, way to try and think of it. So I'm trying to reframe it as a networking opportunity for both sides rather than sort of a give and take situation. Yeah, I like that. Um, now I will introduce a former mentee from the EGU um, mentoring scheme last year. Um, Adithya Nedun Cheran is a master's student um, at the University of, let me just double check. University of uh, L'Aquila in Italy and the Sapienza University of Rome. Um, and he's a master's student in atmospheric sciences. Thank you, Dr. Jenny, for introducing me. Okay, so uh, I attended EGU twice. So the last year I also applied for the EGU mentoring scheme and I was mentored by Dr. Jenny Turton. And uh, I also attended four in person conferences previously before the pandemic. So uh, and also one more mentoring scheme in another conference. But I uh, really like this mentoring. A uh, few reasons being because uh, we actually planned out when we are going to meet before online as uh, we plan. And then we discussed these are my aims. For example, since I'm in a master's program, I want to apply for a PhD program next once I finish this. So uh, she actually told me this is how uh, it goes on. So I should not really hurry up uh, during uh, my master's and so many things. and. Uh, and we also met during the conference. So as uh, we planned, this is how I'm going to uh, attend all those uh, sessions of my interest and look for other topics to attend as well, not just really atmospheric science, maybe something that's a little off the atmospheric science might also be of interest to you. So I also ended up attending those sessions because uh, those, those were nice. And uh, at the end to uh, uh, actually then discuss what I did during the virtual conferences, and not just this, uh, since uh, she also had other mentees with her, I think there were also four other mentees with her. So we all met together um, in the first meeting, also during the conference, and we also got to network more. Otherwise, during this uh, virtual conferences, we don't generally talk to a lot of people. So this uh, this was very helpful for me to network with other people. Otherwise, during the sessions, we barely que send questions and then interact with most people. At least that's what I, I didn't really get to interact with a lot of people uh, during the virtual conferences as compared to the in-presence ones. And uh, then uh, from her experiences, uh, she told me uh, how it is for a PhD candidate for so that I can actually decide if I really want to get into PhD, not just because I'm interested in research, I should uh, end up doing a PhD, right? So maybe in industry as well, there is R&D where I can uh, go and do the research. And uh, the EGU pairing is really nice. Uh, because I actually got paid to her and from her experience actually helped me out. And uh, not necessarily that every, she's an ECS herself. So I actually liked uh, that I got paid to an ECS because she's exactly where I would like to be in the future. So she knows what's happening right now. If, uh, uh, and maybe I might be wrong in saying this, for example, my supervisor, she is like, uh, oh, I think in her fifties, so her experience is going to help me, yes, but uh, probably what's happening currently, uh, she might be knowing more and ECS would be actually knowing uh, better about it. And we could actually, uh, since the age difference is not much, so we can exchange thoughts more uh, uh, frequently. And then we also kept in touch through emails and then uh, discuss a few things here and there, or maybe send uh, greetings uh, during Christmas, New Year. Um, so yeah, so for me, it was a really nice experience. And if you were attending EGU this year, so you should definitely do it, be it in person or uh, the virtual one. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Those are very nice words also. 
Um, our final speaker today is Lena Nowak, who is a lecturer in volcanology and geology at the Freie University in Berlin. And she is also the Outstanding Student and PhD Candidate Presentation, OSPP, Award Coordinator. Thanks so much for the introduction. I hope you can see uh, my shared screen now. The presentation's perfect. Yeah, so I want to introduce to you something else, a different scheme that we have at EGU, which I think is uh, equally beneficial also to the early career stu uh, participants, students, and PhD candidates that we have at EGU. And this is the so-called OSPP contest, so the Outstanding Student and PhD Candidate Presentation Contest. Um, this contest has actually um, been organized since quite a long time. So it started actually in 2003 with one of the EGU divisions, the HS division, that wanted to give a stronger highlight to the poster presentations that they had in their division. And since then, it was actually from year to year growing and adding more divisions. And at some point, like in 2008, um, it became more or less union-wide. So almost every division participated in this contest. And at that point, it also got a little bit more, more structured. So um, this contest is um, awarding out of about 30 participants, uh, always uh, one or the best top uh, presentation. Uh, originally it was a poster presentation, uh, changed over the time, and I'm coming back to this in the next slide. Now, um, in, in uh, the last years, we always had something like 2,000 participants per year stretched over the, uh, the entire EGU. So this really leads then to, to a lot of OSP awardees, and I'm really happy that um, so many um, early career scientists could, could benefit from the scheme from the OSP contest. Um, I don't think I have to, to say anything specific of why in 2020 we did not have a contest. I think you all know what happened and uh, it was actually too, too short of time to, to be able to react and to organize the contest for a virtual meeting. But uh, now we actually got up to track and uh, started again this uh, OSPP contest last year. And um, well, for next year or this year, 2022, Azia, what could be you? So, what is this contest? Um, what is it about? Um, well, as I said, originally it was actually planned um, as contest for poster presentations. So originally EGU started having all the presentations and poster presentations and the uh, poster sessions uh, sometimes were not attended as good. So with giving actually an additional emphasis on the posters um, by asking people to come to the poster board and actually judge uh, the with different criteria as uh, the posters that have been presented uh, by uh, bachelor master students or phd candidates this also gave a larger emphasis than to the poster sessions uh, a couple of years later um, we started this great pico scheme so i don't know how many of you have been at the last in-person uh, egu meeting which is now almost three years ago actually uh, where you also have a screen um, similar to a poster board, but actually showing an electronic presentation um, of your work. And also the idea is the same thing, that we wanted to give a stronger highlight to, to this type of presentation and uh, attract more people to join uh, for the PICO sessions. And so the, the rules for this contest is that everyone who is a bachelor or master student or PhD candidate can participate in the contest. Um, you can also participate if you just finished your PhD uh, after the 1st of January of the year that the EGU is taking place. So for this year, it would actually be uh, if you obtained your degree after the uh, beginning of the year, um, even as a postdoc, you're allowed to participate this year. Uh, what is really important uh, is that if you want to participate in the contest, you have to be the first and presenting author of the submitted abstract. Sadly, sometimes this uh, creates problems if your PhD supervisor, for example, submitted um, the, the presentation for you, or if you're a second author but a presenting author, you're not eligible for the award. Um, this was actually the, the rules of the, of the presentation contest until two years ago, three years ago, actually. Now with the virtual conference, of course, things have changed. And um, those of you that have participated in EGU last year know that we had different types of presentations that uh, could be given virtually. Uh, you could upload a poster or an, a recorded presentation. 
Um, so that last year we then decided as long as each EU is a, is a virtual meeting or a hybrid meeting that actually all presentations would be eligible to participate in this contest. So for this year, uh, we already know that all presentations will be uh, short oral presentations. And so this is actually what will be evaluated then um, as part of the contest. So the oral presentations that you have and also the ability to answer questions, either live directly as part of the oral session or later via the abstract page, you can also start to communicate with the different abstract, uh, uh, with the authors and uh, with other EGU participants. Um, there may also be some someone who would like to evaluate um, your your work and um, give a vote, but uh, who was not able to actually see the presentation live in the oral session. And uh, for this, there's also the possibility to upload uh, some display material. So uh, you should also make use of this, of course. So what are actually the evaluation criteria? Uh, what uh, will the, the judges actually vote on? And these are typically three different categories that people are looking at. And um, it's regarding to the relevance of the study, how significant, for example, is it? The scientific accuracy. So this is uh, both um, more with respect to the scientific content, but also the way how you present your work is really important. And so something like the clarity of presentation, uh, but also things like the aesthetic appeal or the ability to answer questions, all of these are criteria that are taken into account as part of this contest. Who is actually going to vote? Who's going to evaluate your presentation? Um, for this, actually, uh, the uh, conveners of each of the session uh, will find at least three judges before the uh, General Assembly, before EGU, that uh, will uh, be asked to look at your presentation and to evaluate it. But we also want to make this evaluation or this voting open to all EGU participants. So actually, since last year, it's now possible that all registered EGU participants from postdoc level on, as long as they're eligible and not conflicted. So they should not be co-author, they should not have the same shared affiliation as first author, of course, but all of them can actually also in addition vote. And um, so this way we will really find out which are the best uh, top 3% of the presentation that are participating in the contest. And this is also something, if people are interested to become a, a mentor and to support early career scientists, of course, being part of a mentoring scheme is one way to do it, but also supporting the OSPP candidates by voting on um, these kind of presentations is also a really great uh, way to support early career scientists. Now, the last thing that you may wonder about is why should you actually participate? Why go through the trouble? Why have people evaluate you or your, your presentation? And <clears throat> well, for me personally, actually the most important thing is, um, as I said in the beginning, that it really attracts more people to your work. So it's really, it gives you a better visibility for your research, um, but it's, it is also a contest. The contest does have an award, so uh, you will get a nice certificate. And what it's also really nice also for the visibility of your research, uh, there will be uh, some kind of official way of giving you the awards. So as in-person meetings, typically there's an award ceremony or in the division meetings, the awards will be presented uh, to you in front of as a members of your division. You will are also allowed uh, to submit an, um, an article to one of the open exp, um, EGU journals, and this will be actually free of charge. And you will be invited to come back for the next EGU meeting, and you will not have to pay anything for the conference registration. So this, I think, is also a really, really big benefit uh, that as an early career scientist, you already you're sure that you're going to come back next year at the next EGU as well. Um, for me personally, um, um, I actually participated in the OSPP, or at that time the name of the contest was different, as a PhD student myself. I did try it a couple of times, but um, well, the thing is you can uh, submit or you can participate in this contest as often as you want, as long as you're eligible, so still a student or PhD candidate. And, and in my final year, I was actually uh, successful. 
And this was actually for me a really great thing because uh, it's the next um, general assembly, there was a division meeting and um, I was asked to come to the front to receive the certificate. And um, I mean, this was nice, but in the first row, there was actually a very well-known female scientist sitting there. And I knew her, but I don't think she really knew me before. And we had met once or twice, but I don't think she remembered me. And she was sitting there, she was looking at me, like, ah, she was recognizing me, smiling at me and putting her thumbs up. It was like, wow, she recognized me. She, she knows now who I am. One year later, I started as a postdoc in her lab. So I think it was really, it was a really great way for her to notice me as well. And also um, now that I've been uh, a judge uh, for about 10 years in this contest myself, I must say for me, I really like it to be a judge as part of the OSPP contest because when I'm a judge, I'm forced in a way positively forced to look at a presentation that normally I might actually not take the time to really check out carefully. And over the past years, um, I regularly, I actually met scientists and, and got to know really exciting science that normally I would not have known about. And even started later on then, like a couple of years later, joint projects with um, OSPP participants whose work I probably would not have known if I wouldn't have been a judge. So in that sense, even if only the top 3% of the presentation can actually be considered for an award in the end, it might be still beneficial for everyone to participate. And so these in a way are my last words to really uh, for everyone consider signing up for the OSPP contest. And for those from a postdoc level on, participate in voting and supporting the early career scientists um, as judges. And so uh, these are the last, last words uh, that I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. It seems like there's a really uh, nice overlap between the two schemes, the OSPP and the mentoring scheme, that everybody involved is really getting something out of it. And especially moving forward, there are advantages going forward in your career path, not just related to the General Assembly, which is really great. So all of our speakers have now um, introduced their different topics. And so now we're gonna move on to a more discussion or a Q&A session. So a reminder again, just to put your questions into the Q&A box so that we can then ask them directly to um, the speakers. Uh, but I thought I would just come back firstly to Solmaz just to ask um, for um, a bit of clarification about the difference between the in-person and the virtual attendees. If people are in person attending the GA, will they only be matched up with somebody else in person or is this not possible? So we are going to um, leave that up to the people who have applied either as a mentee or a mentor. We will, do, we will be doing the matching regardless of um, how people choose to attend the conference, right? So that will not be taken into account. So it could be very, possible that a mentee who is um, participating in person will be matched with a mentor who will be participating virtually or the other way around, or perhaps both of them will be attending virtually or in person. So um, we won't be using that as a uh, criteria for matching the mentees and the mentors. In, in the context of whether or not they should be meeting in person if they can, so if both of the mentee and the mentor are attending the GA in person, it's really up to them how they want to do it. So we always suggest that uh, prior to the week of um, EGU 22, they get in touch via email and um, arrange for perhaps a virtual meeting first and discuss if they're comfortable to meet in person. And if both feel comfortable and want to do that, it's really up to them um, how they want to proceed with that. That's great, thank you. And um, we heard that um, uh, Aditya mentioned that numerous people were assigned up to one mentor. So some mentors can have uh, a number of mentees. Um, is there a limit on this? And do you think that that's important that they have sort of a numerous mentees with them? So I, I believe that the, the mentors can choose um, anywhere between one to three mentees. So the maximum number I think is three. Um, Last year, when I participated in this program as a mentor for the very first time, I also I asked for two, so I was uh, paired with two mentees, and I thought that was really nice um, because um, I was actually able to arrange meetings for the two of them. 
So I was not only providing feedback and working with um, the mentees, but the mentees are also in the same um, virtual space, um, discussing things with me, but also with one another. So they will also get to know each other and they can also be of support to one another if they choose to be. Uh, so that's a really nice, Thing about having more than one mentee is that you can choose to bring them together into one virtual space or if you are meeting in person maybe you know the the, um, the few of you can get together and um, meet that way so um, but again this is really up to the mentor how many mentees they want to choose and um, I think choosing two as opposed to one I didn't see that really as a as an obstacle but it was kind of nice to have um, an additional person um, and it also makes it, I think, nicer sometimes for the mentees and also for the mentors um, when you have other people joining in and you have a slightly larger group than a, just a one-on-one -on -one, um, discussion. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, we heard from a few of the speakers that early career scientists are eligible to sign up for the mentoring scheme to be a mentor, which is great. Um, Steph, I was just wondering at what stage did you start being a mentor and how has your experience changed through your career? Um, I try and think when the mentoring scheme was first introduced, because I think that's probably when I was doing it as a mentor. And I wonder if that was 2019, 2018. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I was a postdoc at the time, and I was also, I think, just before around the time I was early career scientist representative for um, for EGU. Um, I think it was just because it was new and it was the first time. And I do, I mean, now in my role as a researcher developer, basically that is my my job now. I basically, even though I say I mentor one person. Um, but I do mentor quite a lot of people that they might not be aware of. That's what I'm doing, but that's part of my role now. Um, I definitely have learned, I think at, when at the first time I did it, I felt it was a lot more about the mentee in the sense of making them um, meet people and having them kind of meet others and kind of the networking part where I think as I've done it more actually I find it is more now about the discussion part so actually the networking kind of comes more naturally now I think where you maybe suggest someone um, but I feel now I, I really focus more on the kind of the discussion and the reflection as well what what does my mentee want rather than who do they have to meet it's more like what do they want where do they want to go how can they get there um, and so, for example, the, the mentee I have at the moment, um, she's really kind of set on applying for a fellowship um, for her like, kind of next career step. And I have no idea how to do that. I've never had a fellowship. Um, I don't really know, you know what's going on. So I've reached out to someone. Um, so I think it's also kind of now been realizing kind of where your limits are in a way. And but then obviously using your maybe connections you have to say, look, I can't help. I can't help with that, but I will find someone and I definitely um probably wouldn't have been comfortable maybe saying that at the start it was just a kind of um thinking it was like a one-to-one -one when it actually isn't you're kind of a door to other people um as well okay that's great thank you so much um and Adithian, you mentioned quite positive things about your time being a mentee with the egu scheme um how do you think it varied to other schemes you've done especially if one of them was virtual and the other one was was more in person hmm, okay so uh the one the from a pre from the mentoring scheme in the other conference i was not really paired with someone from the kind of field that i wanted to be in uh, probably because of the shortage of the mentors over there. So I was paired with someone who was an uh, uh, astrobiologist, actually. So uh, maybe he was good enough in telling me a few general things and suggesting me maybe this is how you, uh, the general journey is. But for me, I really wanted more of a personal advice in how this specific area of research works. So I was not able to really get it from him, but then only a few generals, uh, only the general things I could get from him. Whereas in case of... Uh, the EG mentoring scheme, I was paired with someone who's more specialized in what I wanted to do. So you you actually helped me uh, get there and uh, get to know more about uh, of my area of interest rather than someone just because, uh, no disrespect, because uh, he's also an early career scientist, but from a different area of research, he could help me out. But it didn't really 
uh, helped me out the way I wanted it to be. Okay, so maybe you highlight that. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think it highlights quite well that in some cases you might need to sort of have many mentors throughout your life, maybe at different stages That's or right. as your interests vary, you might want to also see if you can reach out to a different mentor. That's great. Um, thank you. Um, and Lena, you mentioned that um, anyone who isn't a student can sign up to, to be a judge for the OSPP scheme. Um, what if um, somebody is sort of friends with someone or someone is a professor who knows somebody? How does that work? Well, of course, at some point, it's difficult to actually find if, if judges are eligible or not. Um, we actually do see it regularly that people with the same affiliation still try to add a vote. Um, and it's it's actually registered. But of course, the coordinators that look at the awards in the end and select the awards, then it's stupid. Now they they see if the affiliation is, is the same, just with in a, in a maybe slightly different way or so. If people are friends, of course, this is something that's impossible to detect. And I ideally hope that uh, everyone is uh, responsible enough to only vote when you do not feel conflicted yourself in, in both ways. Actually, I've also seen it in one case that a colleague from the same institute gave a vote, which was the lowest grade that you could actually give. So they probably didn't like each other. Of course, this is not taken into account because via the affiliation, we can easily filter it out. But uh, if, you, if you feel conflicted, if you're friends or family, or if you just know each other, or you have been maybe studying together, uh, but are now at different institutes, you should not vote. Thank you, thank you very much. And now that we have heard all about the mentoring and the OSPP scheme, um, Adithia, would you be interested now in signing up as uh, an OSPP um, uh, participant? I couldn't get that word out, sorry, an OSPP participant, or in the future, perhaps a mentor? Uh, okay, I might uh, personally want to first attend the EGU in person and definitely participate in OSPP as a participant. Maybe a mentor. Uh, Maybe let's say if I end up in a PhD, then yes, I can try that. Yeah, in the future, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. We do have a question in our Q&A box. So this is from Marie. She says, I always worry that being a mentor will take up too much time, especially leading up to the meeting when I'm usually scrambled to get my presentation ready. Did any of the former mentors feel like it got in the way or slowed you down in any way? Um, we'll start with Steph. Uh, no is the short answer. I think um, obviously it's down to your, I guess, time management. And one of the things, one of the first things you, you probably need to do is um, be honest how much time you have and let your mentees know. And if you tell a mentee, um, I can give you half an hour in this week and then maybe two you know, hours during the General Assembly. But while we're there, I'll be obviously 100% there. I think, you know, that's great if you have, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, but they're going to be really valuable because I can, you know, we maybe email before because you don't have that much time for to maybe meet on a Zoom call. But if we can email before and all we do in that Zoom call is you tell me your responses to my questions. Um, I think that is to a good mentor mentee relationship, I think is expectation management is key how much time do i have to give you and what does that then mean for the mentee you know because they might want to focus on certain things if they know they only have 10 of your precious minutes but if you can tell them look i can meet for a full afternoon for a coffee chat that's a whole different conversation to have so i think it's um have a think about how much time you think you, you can you can give um and then just be honest about all that and i think the mentees would benefit from um, I would say maybe 15 minutes, the minimum, if there's email conversations before, and then maybe up to an hour at a time. But um, so my mentor meetings at the moment um, are not longer than an hour, but then we don't do really email in between, but it's quite, it's just the relationship I now have with my mentee. We do a lot of kind of chat and updates on life and other things. But um, if I would take on someone new, I would probably start with 15 minutes. What do you want to get out of this? This is how I can help and have this kind of um, conversation really early on. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Salmas, is there a specific requirement? Do you do you suggest anything to mentors and mentees? 
Um, I also agree with what uh, Stephanie mentioned that um, it's important to be honest about your your time commitment uh, with one another. Um, as I mentioned, if you are a mentor and you are mentoring more than one mentee, you could um, have one meeting for all of your mentees and in that way you reduce the number of meetings you've had. So that's one strategy to go about it. Um, but in my case, I also spent a little bit more time prior to the conference um, with my mentees, especially because both of them wanted my feedback on their presentations. It was their first presentations at a large conference, and they even wanted me to take a look at their slides and you know, make some comments and maybe improve their presentations a little bit. So we could, those, we could do those kind of things prior to the conference so that during the conference, when our time is more limited, we could stay a bit more focused on the program itself. So depending on what you want to do, you could also shift some of the work maybe to, uh, prior to the conference or even uh, things that really have nothing to do with the conference and you want to still discuss with your mentees and the mentees are interested, do it after the conference. Perfect, thank you. Lena? Yeah, maybe me for, for mentor, I should also say that I, I was cheating a little bit in the past and so the before GA meeting, I typically scheduled during the icebreaker for the reason because the week before as, a, as an OSPP coordinator there's a lot of work so I'd, I I couldn't really concentrate on meeting with a mentee during the ice because it's completely different and I can really take one or two hours time of it actually the offer to to look over the presentation slides that's what I've done as well but uh, then via email before actually meeting as the general assembly but I think that's really something, um, it, it really depends on the mentor and the mentees. So um, in, in the past, I had the feeling that if you meet on Sunday, it's, it's, it might be still in time. But of course, if you can take the time the week before, it's much better. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I do think you mentioned that you, um, you speak now by email with your, your previous mentor, and but you also met sort of online. Um, did you agree with that beforehand or is it just kind of evolved organically that you still keep in touch no it was more of organic thing i don't remember agreeing with anyone like that so because you just want to maintain the professional connect right so possibly you might also help me out again in the future and then maybe we could also meet in the next conference in eu so yeah that's how it was and also one more thing i forgot to add up so basically i'm an engineer i'm an aerospace engineer so and i was shifting shifting to atmospheric science so I also needed some help in this transition, right? So at this point of time, when probably you're shifting your specialization, you might need a specific kind of advice. So it's also great that I received uh, with this specific uh, mentoring. Maybe there might be other people uh, who were probably confused that, okay, I was doing something in this specialization. I wanted to do something more. Do you think really uh, I can uh, switch it? And then if yes, how can I do it smoothly? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. OK, we're coming to the end of our webinar now. Um, we haven't got too much longer left, but I think a final question that was posed in the in the Q&A box is um, about feedback, how to gain feedback um, once you have participated in these events. Um, is there a way for EGU to gather feedback or also for mentors and mentees to reflect and also participants and have a, have a think about what they would do better or what they enjoyed? Uh, Solmaz, we'll start with you first. So as far as I know, in the last um, mentoring um, programs for the last EGU General Assembly meetings, um, we didn't systematically collect feedback from the mentees and the mentors. Um, I think we had maybe one or maximum two questions in the final survey form that we ask all attendees to complete. Um, but we didn't have a specific, you know, um, feedback collection from the mentors and the mentees. And this is something that I, I'm working on at the moment um, with this year's uh, EGU meeting um, to change that a little bit and begin talking to the mentees and the mentors and get their feedback and use their feedback to improve the program. So we will be doing that um, beginning this year. Okay, great. And Lena for the OSPP um, scheme? 
So what we actually do have is that each of the OSPP participants receives the feedback from the evaluations. So this is something that we have implemented so that independent of if you are elected for in what or not, that you, you get a feedback of uh, what people found uh, specifically good uh, um, about your poster or your, uh, your peak presentation. We did not do it for the virtual content, but we, we will add uh, this kind of feedback in the future again. Um, if there is any specific um, feedback that um, either you or others would like to share about the organization of the OSPP content uh, contest, then um, we have in each division, we have an OSPP coordinator and they are happy to, to receive any kind of feedback or if you prefer also you can of course contact me directly as an EGU wide OSPP coordinator. And um, actually the feedback that we got in the past was typically always implemented then for future meetings. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and Stephanie, you mentioned sort of how it's changed as you've moved through your mentoring um, career. And I'm just wondering how you personally feedback and reflect. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so with um, my current mentee, actually, as I said, so that um, I can't remember what the onset was, but I think it had similar to the, this mentoring scheme, there was kind of a time limit where they were basically said, this is for how long we'll be kind of helping you and then after that you're on your own so I think considering we're still um, like talking 18 months in is a good sign um, however and I have checked um, every now and then I, I did ask like is this still helpful and if not like no hard feelings just tell me it's no longer you know I mean it's not part you know I'd rather you find someone that you find helpful um, and then we have changed through those conversations we have changed the focus a little bit um, as well, when she's like, actually, maybe, you know, I can still help. Um, and then I think the other way for me, it's just kind of thinking about mostly my time. I would love, you know, in a way, like, I would love to help so many more people, but it's been, it's like one person at the moment. I had an, a second person for a while um, who just from their time commitments couldn't do it anymore. Um, and that's the other one, I think, is just every now and then kind of checking in with time commitments and can I still give this person the time they need? And as I said, for example, with the fellowship coming up, um, I'm waiting for another person that I reach out to, to to get back and see if they can do it, for example. And that's probably going to be another time point. It's like, are you going to need both of us at the moment? And if so, maybe we go from, so at the moment we meet once, we used to meet fortnightly, now we meet once a month. Um, will it go down to once every other month? Will it go down to I mean, there will be a point where maybe you should just check in a quarter and then organically it might kind of fizzle out actually as you know as they move on and, and do other things. Um, and I do think this kind of, this is probably for, if you are a mentor, even a mentee, I guess, after the general assembly, this is probably a question it's like, would I like to meet with this person again? If yes, why? If not, why not as well? And that can maybe help you figure out maybe the next mentor, maybe they, you know, like we've heard, maybe they weren't quite in the right field. And now I can use this actually, like what field do I need or what do I want to get out of that and use it as a learning curve as well. Like who do you want to connect with and use that experience to help you. Um, and it's worthwhile to reach out to people afterwards as well and ask if they'd be willing, you know, to mentor, you know, either even if you enjoyed it, you know, let your mentor know that it was a good experience and you would like to keep in touch, you know, maybe on, how, like whatever they can offer, you have to be a bit flexible with the time of your um, your mentor. Okay, thank you so much. This has been a really informative webinar. We've heard a lot about mentoring opportunities and feedback that people have, but also on um, the award scheme for early career science for students. Um, so thank you everybody so much for this webinar. Um, it will be uploaded to the EGU YouTube channel um, in a couple of weeks. So if you uh, wanted to come back and hear the uh, advice again, then feel free. Um, have a nice rest of your evening. Bye bye.